It was the Super Bowl weekend of owl hunting as we continued our quest to see all of Minnesota's owls. Saturday, we headed to a wetland reserve to watch short-eared owls hunt. Even though short-eared owls often hunt in the daytime, we were told that these owls are seldom active in the morning. So we spent some time power line birding for Shrike and Kestrel. We were able to get some photos of eagles and red-tailed hawks. Probably the best photo of the day was of a horned lark. Sadly, the owls didn't start hunting until right before dark and they were very far away from the road. The first owl we saw hunting was immediately chased by a harrier. There are six owls that live in this wetland. They have ground roosts. Even though they are communal, they will often fight with each other. They make low passes over the fields and this made them extremely hard to photograph. The underside is white and this is how you can identify them when they are flying. We watched three owls hunt, which was fun, but were not able to get good photos that I was hoping for. One positive was finding out the location of long-eared owls from another birder. Sunday was a much sunnier day. We went looking for the long ears at a park we had been to many times before. Long-eared owls form winter roosts and colonies. They have been found in groups as large as 150 birds. We were told there were six owls in this park. Their camouflage is incredible. They are strictly nocturnal, so during the day they sit in trees trying to blend in with a thick cover. The first tree we found had two owls in it. I had my aperture priority setting on, so the background was blurred for all my photos. This made it impossible to capture both birds in one shot. They both appear to be females. Most owls that hunt in open prairie, such as the short-eared owl, do not have ear tufts. But owls that hunt in the woods, like long-eared owls and great horned owls, do have them. They are not actually horns or ears, but just clumps of feather. So what is the point? Well, it seems that they are useful in non-verbal communication, as the owls would erect these and seem to signal to each other with these ear tufts. It also seems like it serves a role in camouflage as the owls would often shut their eyes tight and make a V shape to blend in with branches. It's hard to see their face when the ear tufts are in a V. In a nearby tree, we found a male. Males are smaller and more gray. When approached closely, the owls will alternately open and close their eyes to give predators the impression that they are sleeping. Again, I was shocked at how small these owls were. They are only a foot tall, while a great horned owl is more like three feet tall. While the males are smaller, they can give a deep whoop that can be heard from over a mile away. Although we have never been close to these owls before, I had picked up their call and been fooled into thinking I was close. Small ways away, we found a well-camouflaged fourth owl, which was another female. This owl was frozen in the tall, thin position that they often take when approached. They can change their body shape and plumage quite a bit. Owls can dilate their pupils much more rapidly than humans. They can also dilate one pupil at a time, as seen here. If an owl's head was the size of a human's, their eyes would be the size of grapefruits. I can't imagine having two grapefruit-sized objects on my face. This owl flew to a nearby branch. Their wingspan is about three feet. A person informed us that there were only five owls left now because one had been eaten by the barred owl. I had seen this barred owl here on several previous visits. He had seemed so innocent. I'm guessing the colony will work together to defend each other as there are also great horned owls in this park and a bobcat. If you want lots of wildlife activity, you just need to go to a metro park. My son was able to capture a photo as this female began working on getting a pellet out. They eat mostly small mammals. They kill prey with their talons and consume it whole. Once a day, they regurgitate these pellets of bones and fur. The pellets are made in the gizzard and can be stored for up to 20 hours. Since the pellet blocks the entrance to the digestive system, it must be disgorged before the owl can eat again. After disgorging, which is a great word, this owl felt much better and became much more photogenic.
Finally, we found the fifth bird, which appeared to be also a male. These birds will likely stick around until the end of February. Hopefully, I'll be able to return sometime and get some shots of them in flight. Since it was still two hours until the Super Bowl started, we decided to make another attempt to find the Eastern Screech Owl. We have seen them posted in different places along the Mississippi River, always in tree cavities. We have found out that they will often come out in the daytime when it's sunny. We walked along the river in Minneapolis looking for a familiar looking tree cavity or a person with binoculars. Someone had seen one earlier in the day, but it had been scared back into its cavity by some dogs passing by. We watched some eagles flying over the river while we waited, staring at the tree that it was in. Finally, the tip of its head surfaced. It acted like it was going to come out and look around. The owl was of the red variety, which is usually more common in the east. We are supposed to have gray screech owls, but all the pictures I have ever seen posted are red. Only a few seconds after popping up, an eagle flew over low and the owl went back into its cavity. It could have been a coincidence. It would have been nice to get some better shots, but the owls stick around all year, so it should be easy to find again. <laughs>